large number of visitors at one time? And do we need to consider developing techniques for reducing the number of visitors if necessary? We may not know all the solutions to carrying capacity, but we can take steps to minimize the impact of over-visitation. At Zion National Park in Utah, at Acadia National Park in Maine, and at other park sites, there are now innovative transportation systems that reduce the impact of auto traffic and allow visitors to have a better experience. For example, at Muir Woods in Northern California, one of the homes of the coastal redwood trees, a shuttle bus allows the visitors to park their individual cars at a designated spot and allow the shuttle bus to provide the transportation to the park site. Lastly, another lesson learned is simply moving with the times. With an increase in visitation to our parks, there is a need for more personnel to provide educational and interpretive services. But without the necessary funding to add new rangers, we are looking for new techniques to fulfill this need and in recognizing our changing audience. For example, Alcatraz Island in Northern California makes available an audio tour for their visitors. Every visitor to The Rock receives an audio device and headphones which provides a pre-recorded tour that visitors can stop and start at their leisure throughout the former prison facility. Adding to the recording are the voices and stories of former inmates and prison guards, as well as sounds of the prison door slamming that help create an authentic experience of what it must have been like to have been incarcerated or worked at Alcatraz. The audio tour is now available in 10 languages, including Italian and Mandarin Chinese. Our challenge continues to be, how do we provide wonderful and memorable visitor experiences while protecting the resources? To meet this challenge, we are supported and inspired by our upcoming 100th anniversary on August 25, 2016. The National Park Service Centennial Initiative, as announced by President George W. Bush on the 90th anniversary of the National Park Service, provides a framework for establishing new ideas, new visions, and concepts, and to evaluate progress to move the National Park Service into the second century of existence. The initiative is bolstered by five overarching goals. The first, to lead America in preserving and restoring treasured resources. The second, to demonstrate environmental leadership to the nation. The third, to offer superior recreational experiences where visitors explore and enjoy nature and the great outdoors, culture, and history. The fourth, foster exceptional learning opportunities connecting people to parks, especially children and seniors. And the last goal, to achieve management and partnership excellence to match the magnificence of the treasures entrusted to its care. The National Park Service Centennial Initiative is an excellent tool for garnering attention on our parks. And we must be able to capitalize on this opportunity and at the same time determine how to move forward as a system. When President Bush and Secretary of the Interior, Dirk Kamthorn, announced the Centennial Initiative in 2006, they vowed federal money would be set aside for the parks to use to improve facilities, education venues, the visitor experience, and employee training and morale. This is the first time we have received new and additional funds, and yet we still need more, to optimize each park's potential. As part of this initiative, we have established the Centennial Challenge, a public-private partnership program. This program provides the Park Service the opportunity to join with our partners with a 50-50 match of funds, 50% from the government and 50% from the partner, to support a particular project or program at an individual park. These partners consist of community groups, individual donors, corporate sponsors, and park supporters. While our partners do generously contribute to our parks throughout the year, this Centennial Challenge program provides the federal match in funds, so we are now able to leverage the partner contribution for a greater impact at the park. As you can imagine, we are quite excited by this. While our
Congress approved this program and provided new funds for 2008, we are now working to have additional funds committed every year until 2016 and hopefully beyond. All of these projects and programs will reflect at least one of our centennial goals of stewardship, environmental leadership, recreational experience, education, and professional excellence. In building and involved citizenry who care about the national parks into this century and into the future, we need to continually find ways to immerse our public in the national park experience and invite their help with the stewardship of the parks. It's not enough to talk about the parks or show pictures of the parks. We need to draw the public to our parks with the new projects and programs. Nearly every national park in our system has at least one community that exists close to the park boundary. Because parks do not exist in a vacuum, issues that come about in a park can also affect the surrounding community and vice versa. National parks around the country are working with local communities to stimulate stewardship ethics and assist in the commitment for sustainability. It has become obvious that it is no longer enough to strive for friendly coexistence, but that all parties must work proactively on their mutual interests and to develop cooperative strategies that contribute to some measure of sustainability and long-term conservation. The National Park Service is forever indebted for the ideas shared in a 2002 workshop convened by the Italian Nature Conservation Service and the Lazio Regional Parks and the National Park Service to discuss how parks and communities work together, as well as another workshop convened in the Czech Republic in 2006 to discuss the marketing and promotion of local heritage products. Our staff at Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park in Vermont and at our Conservation Studies Institute have taken the lead in surveying and inventorying more than two dozen case studies where our park units are working closely with local communities. Our stewardship atlas is a direct result of the inspiration from our Italian colleagues and the efforts of our staff to chronicle these public-private, park-local community partnerships. Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio was inspired by the European approach to maintaining agriculture and working cultural landscapes in national parks and created the Countryside Initiative in the late 1990s. The Countryside Initiative strives to sustain the agricultural heritage of the valley and preserves the remaining agricultural land and buildings by rehabilitating and revitalizing more than 20 of the old farms that operated in the valley from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. This partnership between a local nonprofit group local valley farmers, and the National Park has advanced privately supported, economically viable, and environmentally friendly approaches to agriculture in the national park setting. A key step forward has been the opening of seasonal farmers markets, which provide an outlet for high quality food and crafts produced by the initiative. Another area where we are constantly learning great lessons is in the understanding of America's changing demographics and lifestyles. Children are spending less and less time outside. The joy of being outside has been replaced with spending time indoors in front of the television or video game. Children are less likely today to be willing to venture outside and explore on their own. Exploring and playing in the outdoors like climbing trees and building forts, splashing in puddles and streams, allow children to build their natural curiosity, use their imagination, and encourages them to discover more about their world. The National Park Service has taken action over the past few years to re-engage children with the outdoors through new programs and projects, events, and tools. The goal is to attract children to the wonders of the outdoors and away from the television screen. While this may be an uphill battle, the concern is if we do not take action about the current situation, we may witness a fall in support for our national parks and green areas. For starters, we survey all of our national park units and ask them to describe programs at their park that help kids learn and enjoy nature, our culture, and our history 